Okay, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk to residents. It's a pleasure to teaching. And uh, I would like to congratulate Mr. Angelus Collias uh, for his tremendous work in the Young Neurosurgeons Forum, which was always one of my uh, uh, favorite uh, committees in the WFNS. And uh, thank you, Anna Christina, one of my brightest former residents is gonna be certainly the first neurosurgeon uh, in Cabo Verde. As she said, as you know, in Africa, we have five countries uh, who speak Portuguese and uh, we had an obligation to, uh, with those countries who came to Brazil in a very uh, difficult times and shameful times and we started us to helped us to start our nationality. So we have a lot of African, more than 6% or more of our country is made of African blood. Uh, to them, we are absolutely very much grateful. Let me start. Uh, 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 Please, yeah. if you let me just interrupt you for 30 seconds. Now we have 25 participants. I would like to share a poll with you all, if you can answer. Please, it's like uh, three questions just for us to know if everyone is is uh, looking through the question, just for us to know what kind of participant do we have and to direct our next uh, webinars. If, there are, if you are looking, please, if you can answer. Okay, the question, there are three questions. We will leave it for 30 seconds. Yes, if you yes. can please answer. Which country are you, the age, and what are your current status in neurosurgery? Okay. In five seconds, we will end the questions. We have 15 so far of the 23 presents. Okay. Okay, I will show you now the results. Uh, half of the artists uh, of the audience take the, the question. So it's uh, Africa and South America, the, the country we are seeing now. Most have around 31 to 40 years old and the most are consultant or specialists. Thank you. And now we're continuing with Dr. Rilda's presentation. Thank you, Anna. Uh, would you uh, get rid of this? Okay. Can you get rid of this it, slide again? Okay. Is it still on my screen? Yes, I'm seeing your screen just fine. Can you continue? The slide is still on my screen. Is there any problem, doctor? Okay, it's out. Okay. okay, let's restart again. So in this 45 or 50 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, uh, not only talking about the compressive craniectomy, craniectomy for severe TBI. I'm going to share you, young lads, um, some of my ideas about what neurosurgery is all about. So let's start with my history in the WFNS. So in 2001, I started attending the executive committee meetings because I was by then president of the Brazilian Academy of Neurosurgery. And uh, uh, in 2013, I was invited by Professor Jack Brochi 
to be his assistant secretary in the administrative council of the WFNF. In 2009, I was elected also general secretary. And 2013, I was elected uh, first vice president of the WFNF. And I'm very proud to say that I was the first Latin American to occupy these three posts. And in 2017, I was uh, honored with the uh, most honored position of honorary WFNS president, uh, honorary president. So in 2009, uh, during my time uh, when I was secretary, Dr. Peter Black was uh, the president. So we devised this slide. It should be our motto. It should be what we think about the WFNS and of the world as a whole. This small planet is very small for us to keep divided. So we think that we should, must continue building bridges and uniting uh, people from several, uh, 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 from several continents in order to seek for a better performance of humankind. And then during my time uh, as secretary, the chairman of the Young Neurosurgeons Forum was my friend, my great friend, and now Professor Raj Mahmoud from Abuja, Nigeria. And so we established a very good and great and close friendship. And uh, um, from then, so every two years, he sends me one or two residents uh, during the, uh, the first, the final years of their training. They spend six months with us and uh, we keep we give them lodging and um, meals, but unfortunately we cannot give them hands-on according to our laws, but they seem that uh, to be very content with this uh, type of fellowship. And uh, I have been uh, a Nigeria represents uh, perhaps the, the balance of the, the extremely good neurosurgery that we have in Africa and, uh, uh, and the very, very less privileged countries that you have in Africa. So Nigeria for me is a good example of being in the middle. So uh, that's uh, when I got uh, in touch with African neurosurgery. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Anna? Yes, yes, we are. Okay. Listening. Okay. So uh, let's to talk about the compressed craniectomy for severe TBI. I understand that uh, what I mean is primary uh, decompressed craniectomy. I understand that, uh, that this is a very sensitive point issue that perhaps I'm, uh, my ideas uh, will differ uh, from. Uh, some of, uh, of the ideas of my colleagues are in Europe and the United States, but for countries like mine, like your country in Africa, and perhaps in some places of Latin America and Asia, so uh, this should be a life-saving procedure for, for most of uh, our patients. Let's go on. That's uh, uh, our surgical performance. And, uh, uh, we think that uh, we are perhaps in, in Brazil, uh, the, the biggest uh, neurosurgical department uh, for the, our NHS. So we perform altogether three, more than 3,000 operations per year, and we don't include uh, endovascular interventions and my, my, my now patients' procedures. And so uh, in Brazil, uh, I think that we, at least we are amongst the three uh, most uh, busy uh, neurosurgical departments. So we know that we have a lot of intracranial, raised intracranial pressure is a common finding in severe TBI. So 65% of our patients with severe TBI, they develop uh, raised intracranial pressure. I tell, all I say to my residents, that raise the intracranial pressure is, is the great villain, is the great devil of the patient with a neurosurgical pathology. 
with a cerebral and, and brain uh, neurosurgical pathology. And uh, this devil, he's, uh, it, he's got, it's got three uh, siblings. What I, 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 I name it, ischemia, uh, uh, cerebral edema or brain swelling, and uh, cerebral herniation. So when you have an increased intracranial pressure, uh, you should maintain the CPP, you know that the cerebral perfusion pressure, at least around six millimeters of mercury. So by this, uh, you need to raise the mean arterial pressure. So if ICP increases, you know that there is a decrease of cerebral blood flow, there is a decrease of the oxygen contained in the brain tissue, there is the opportunity to develop a, a brain edema, brain swelling, and so on. So, but people could say, well, if we increase the intracranial pressure, if it increases the intracranial pressure, if we increase the arterial pressure, so you should maintain uh, the, uh, the CPP around six millimeters of mercury, uh, the patient would be all right. No, it's not that so. Because we know that if we increase the intracranial pressure above 25, 30 millimeters of mercury, despite the, the CPP is still on a safe levels, you can have a brain herniation. So uh, why people with raised uh, intracranial pressure due to idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Why sometimes we see patients with 40, 50, uh, centimeters, 60 centimeters of water, and they are up and about. It's because they don't develop brain herniation. It's because they don't develop brain shift. So our job is try every time to, uh, uh, to discover uh, the, 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 uh, the, that the intracranial pressure is not uh, normal. Uh, on clinical levels, most of the time, because most of the time here in, in, the, in the developing countries, we don't have uh, how to measure the intracranial pressure in most of the departments. So we need to be very much aware that uh, uh, the intracranial pressure is increasing. And how do you, can we notice that? Because of the Glasgow coma scale. So if the patient is uh, intubated and ventilated, so it's more difficult. So that's one of the problems that we face, that when we uh, treat patients uh, with severe GBI in these, parts, in these parts of the world. My slides are not changing. So uh, what we do when you have a patient with, uh, with severe TBI in the ICU? That's what we do. We elevate the patient, the, the, head, of the, uh, the head of the patient, the head of the bed, around 30 degrees. We sedate the patient. We give analgesia. We optimize if hyperventilation. We do hyperosmolar therapy, CSF drainage, barbiturate coma, hypothermia. Uh, I'll, uh, I'm going to, uh, to, to go through these topics. Why did we discover that 30 uh, degrees elevating the pressure was better than, uh, than you elevate 80 degrees? So if you elevate the head up to 80 degrees, the intracranial pressure will go down, will drop. So, but in doing that, we also decrease the arterial pressure and CPP will be uh, jeopardized. So, uh, uh, due to some uh, research uh, mainly done by the Baylor College of Medicine many years ago, it was uh, established that 30 degrees is not a Kabbalistic number. It, this uh, 30 degrees, it was discovered because of some research that uh, was done in the past. What we talk about optimized hyperventilation. When I was trainee, when they start about and, and they studying uh, the the the, the that lowering the PCO2, you would decrease the intracranial pressure. People would say that we would decrease the PCO2 down to 25 millimeters of mercury. 
that now, today, you think that uh, we say that is no longer advantageous for the patient. So we should maintain it around 35 millimeters of mercury. Sometimes in very special um, situation, mainly you have, uh, if you have a catheter in the jugular bulb, you can decrease it to uh, between 30 and 34 uh, uh, millimeters of mercury, but this should be done very cautiously. Hyperosmolar therapy, we give manitol, we, uh, we give hypertone saline. Uh, uh, if you have a, a catheter in the brain, well, of course, if you release a few millimeters of, uh, of the CSF, it would be very, very good for the patient. How about barbiturated coma? That's the third tier of the rescue ICD. In the past, a very famous neurosurgeon uh, told me that it worked. Uh, but it doesn't, doesn't help. So you should use uh, the barbiturate uh, therapy very cautiously because of course it decreases the intracranial pressure, but also it can decrease the, the cardiac output and also to decrease the, the, the CBF. How about hypothermia? What I say that hypothermia, it not, never has been proved that it's, it's, it's good for the patient with severe TBI. But we know is that a, a, a hyperthermia is dangerous, is harmful to the brain. What I say, if you have a patient with the axillary temperature of around 37, and the nurses come to us and say, well, it's okay, temperature is 37. But if you go to the rectal temperature, it will be about 38. And about the brain, the brain is generally is 2 to 2.5 uh, uh, degrees uh, above the axillary temperature. And so the, the brain temperature will be around 38, 38.5, which is dangerous, is bad for the patient. So I always say that the temperature should be maintained, uh, the axillary temperature should be maintained around 34 to 35, because you would have then a normal temperature in the brain. So that's what, that is my ideas about how I understand that it's sometimes it's very difficult for you uh, uh, in Africa or here in South America because of the, the hot climate, uh, you, the hot temperature of the environment. Uh, it sometimes it's very uh, difficult to decrease the, uh, the temperature of the, of the room where the patient is located. We know that DC is the most effective way to reduce elevated intracranial pressure, of course. In addition, it promotes, promotes normalization of the cerebrovascular reactivity, also reduction of the glycerol, the lactate, glutamate levels. That you know that this, uh, this, uh, these drugs, this, uh, these uh, neurotransmitters, they are elevated in any aggression uh, to the brain. So. Uh, our goal is also to, uh, to decrease this, uh, the levels of these neurotransmitters who, who, that they are harm, uh, harmful to the brain. So, uh, DC is a very old surgery. So now uh, we, I think that we should pay homage to the three great giants of uh, surgery and to, of neurosurgery as as a whole. Let's talk firstly about Dr. Harvey Cushing. For the Americans, he was the found father of neurosurgery. Uh, for the English, it's so, uh, Victor Horsley. For the Scots, it could be, it could be said that uh, it would be Sir William McEwen. But uh, uh, Harvey Cushing uh, was, uh, first of all, he was trained in, in surgery. And when he did his training, he went to he went to to uh, he went to 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 Bern, and he studied with Theodor Koch. Theodor Koch was one of the great. Of course, the Swiss could say that the Theodor Koch was the the founding father of uh, of neurosurgery. I must remember that Professor Koch was the first surgeon to have. Uh, been awarded a Nobel Prize in 1909. And he can be said that he has the, 
the founding father of the endocrinological surgery because he got his Nobel Prize uh, due to his work on thyroid uh, diseases. And uh, he left uh, he, when he died, uh, he, he didn't retire. Uh, he died when he was still uh, working. He had done more than 3,000 operations for the, for, the for the thyroid. So when Dr. When Dr. Costa went, I'm sorry, there is some microphone open. Okay, uh, when Dr. Cushing went to Bern and uh, to study with uh, Theodor Kosha, and uh, Theodor Kosha asked him to go to the laboratory of the Professor Kronecker. And Professor Kronecker, he did some work, put some balloons inside the head of some baboons, and so he described that raising the pressure, it, it, the, the patient should have the triad, the triad of the Cushing triad, which means to be uh, bradycardia, uh, arterial hypertension, and tachypnea. So, but uh, Dr. Kosha uh, also, uh, he did surgery uh, for epilepsy, but also he devised the, the compressing craniectomy for, uh, for relief, the brain pressure, in severe TBI patients. But in, 19, uh, in 1908, Dr. Cushing published in this paper, Annals of, in this journal, Annals of Surgery, uh, uh, his first impression about the compression uh, DC for severe TBI. So what we can say about this uh, procedure between the 50s and 70s. We had a lot of cases published. There was no standard technique. There are there are reports of circumferential craniectomy. Small craniotomies are very dangerous for the brain. They, 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 uh, they lead to venous infarction. They lead to a brain uh, outside herniation. And there was a wide variation of opinions of, about the DC and it fell off in these years. I remember that when I was in Oxford uh, in the 70s, I don't remember any patient have, having had uh, unilateral or bilateral DC for severe TBI. Uh, I don't remember. So that's what we had. We had circumferential craniectomy, very small craniectomy that is better that you don't touch the patient. So it makes a lot of harm. So in the 80s and 90s, uh, there were advances, of course. We had CT coming along in the 70s, MRI in the 80s. So uh, advances in neuroimaging, neurointensive care led to resurgence of interest in DC because we knew that it reduces the ICP. There were no randomized studies. Uh, uh, so we understood that uh, there was a reduction in mortality compared to medical management. There was, a, a, we should a, learn to, to standardize, to, uh, uh, to try to standardize the technique. And of course, there is a, a need for RCT, randomized control trials, uh, for us to seek for, for the truth. So, but uh, at the beginning of uh, these centuries, we start uh, seeing uh, some papers showing that large DCs are very much better than small DCs. And uh, so in this paper from 2000, uh, 2005, we had uh, uh, almost 500 randomized patients. Uh, we showed that uh, they showed that um, large uh, DCs, we had an increase of GOS 4 and 5. So uh, we have almost 4% of patients with uh, GOS 4 and 5. And it was statistically significant uh, when you compare with small craniectomies. And uh, so with small craniectomies, there was a higher incidence of intracranial hematoma in hernia and CSF leak. So also a paper from, from, from Cambridge showed that DC really uh, decreases the intracranial pressure.
But DC, you knew uh, at the beginning of this century that DC effectively reduced the ICP. But does it result in better clinical outcomes? That's the, the $1 million question that we had, and I'm afraid we still have. What we have in the literature today? We had the DECRA. The DECRA was a randomized uh, controlled study. was carried out in Australia, New Zealand, and Saudi Arabia. And uh, we have the rescue ICP. What did you learn from DECRA? Uh, DECRA trial, we had, it was uh, organized, it was taken, it was carried out in eight years, they randomized 155 patients. And so it was best clinical treatment uh, versus DC plus best clinical treatment. The surgery for me was absolutely nonsense. It was bilateral frontal, frontal craniectomy uh, with no Fox or sagittal sinus division. If you by chance decide that it's necessary to do a bilateral by frontal temporal uh, decompressed craniectomy, we need to go down, we need to cut the signs, we need to cut the fox. Because if you don't do that, there was an upward herniation of the brain, so with a, a, a distraction of the corpus callosum. I've seen it at the ACT one of those patients who was operated on a, in, a, in, another, in another center, which the, the results, the post-operative results, according to the CT, and according to the, the MRI, were catastrophic. So what were the results of DECR? The surgery group, last time the ICP, OK. But ICP, OK, down is not the main goal. The goal, the, uh, the goal is the, uh, the good shape of the patient, few interventions for increased ICP, few days in the ICU. However, they, they had worse score on the Glasgow outcome score scale, greater risk of unfavorable results, and the, the PU was significant, and the death rate was similar, and 18 versus 19%. And the mean time for injury to surgery, that's, the, uh, that's the, a key point that I'd like to you to keep in mind. It was 37.5 hours. And uh, we have, the, uh, we have now the rescue ICP. Uh, the stage one, the T1 was mostly uh, clinical. It was clinical care in the ICU. If the patient had, you see, uh, sedation, ventilation, uh, uh, elevation of the elevation of the of of, of the head, monitoring uh, the, the, the 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 venous pressure, the arterial blood pressure, the intracranial pressure. If the intracranial pressure was above 25 millimeters of mercury, it was the, the second stage, the second tier that we, don't, we, were, we, we know about. We, I did mention a few topics. But uh, if the intracranial pressure was above, above 25 millimeters of mercury, for, uh, from 1 to 12 hours, the patient would go to the, to the third tier. The third stage would be barbiturate coma versus DC. So between 2004 and 2014, 408 patients were randomized from 72 different institutions. I understand uh, how uh, difficult can it be to carry out a, a, a study of this, of this type. And uh, uh, sometimes it's very difficult for the patient, for the, for the people to follow uh, the, the rigid protocol of the rescue ICP. I, I understand that uh, there were two centers in Brazil, none of them very, very well known. I don't know uh, those centers as uh, reference centers for training or care. So I understand how difficult can, uh, 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 could it have been for, for the management of those patients uh, 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 in adherence to the rescue ICP protocol. So at conclusion, that at six months, DC 
in patients with traumatic brain injury and refractory intracranial hypertension results in lower mortality and a higher rates of vegetative state, state uh, lower severe disability and upper severe disability than medical treatment. The rates of moderate disability and good recovery were similar in the two groups. Also, the results of this study was a shower of cold, of cold water, uh, at least to myself, that was expecting uh, uh, more information and more favorable information from, from, this, uh, or from this work. So, but we need to go further uh, to, to analyze the results. So uh, if we understand, uh, if you go through the, the details, you see that uh, uh, the time from injury to randomization, 40% uh, of the patients were randomized, 40, 5% were randomized uh, after 72 hours. This for, me is a, this for me is a very important point because if you want to do something uh, life-saving to the patient, uh, 72 hours for me is a, is a, is a long time. So uh, the time from injury uh, to the stage one, so the injury of uh, stage one, so the patient go to some country hospitals and in stage one is the stage one, the patient gets into the ICU He's got a CT, uh, uh, or there is nothing to be operated on, to, no, no clot to be removed, or a clot being removed, the, the patient goes to the ICU. So uh, it was more than 12 hours, in, again, in almost 40% of the patients. And uh, the time from stage one to randomization, uh, it was uh, in median hours, it was in numbers of 44%. Again, for me, uh, a long time to wait. Okay, uh, the time from randomization to DEC, it was two, a bit more than two hours, and for me, it seems to be all right. But I have some important finds that I'd like to, of the rest ACP that were, I'd like to discuss with you. What I, I, I want in this talk, is not only to be answers, but perhaps to to, to, to leave more questions inside your mind for you uh, to decide what are going to do with your patients and perhaps doing some further clinical research. 70% uh, of the patients are treated in the UK, okay? And uh, I understand that 30% of, 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 uh, of, the, the, of, the, of the patients uh, were treated outside the UK and perhaps uh, uh, with more difficult times for uh, for, for getting in touch, et cetera. The median time, more than 72 hours from injury to randomization, it was observing 44% of the patients. It's a long time for my understanding. The median time from stage one to randomization was 43 hours. The median duration of barbiturate therapy, stage three, was 53 hours for 50. <coughs> For two and a half days, they, people were fighting in the ICU, giving, uh, uh, allow me to say, poisoning the brain with the barbiturate, uh, trying to decrease the ICP, and uh, instead of taking the patients to to the to DC, sixty-three, two thirds of the patients were by frontal craniectomy, and one third unilateral. So. Uh, the results, that's one a very strong point that I'd like, uh, like to mention, uh, uh, my dear uh, uh, Professor Go uh, Colliers, is that uh, if you have a need, a pathology, which needs a bifrontal craniectomy, is a completely different pathology of the patient who needs a unilateral craniectomy. So you cannot extrapolate uh, the, the results of the patient where two-thirds were bifrontal craniectomy, uh, to the uh, results of the patient who had unilateral, because unilateral craniectomy by itself, it's, a, it's also a, a very, a, 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 a very a big basket of different pathologies. The patient might have epidural hematoma, the, the patient might have a, 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 a acute subdural hematoma, 
the patient might have brain swelling, the patient might, might have cerebral edema, contusions, uh, brain herniation. So even for unilateral craniectomy, there, were several, uh, uh, there are several pathology uh, entities inside that, uh, that pathology. The crossover from bar barbiturate group to DC was almost 40%. And you remember the results were established on intention to treat. The results were gauged on intention to treat. And according to TB study protocol, favorable outcome was determined from the Glasgow extended GOS uh, from upper severe disability upwards. And when you see these results, the patient with, uh, who had DEC had 45% of, of, of favorable results versus 32% uh, of the patient with the, uh, only with medical treatment. So according to the protocol, uh, DEC uh, had better favorable results than uh, barbiturate coma. So uh, we had the decorative start, the mean time from injury to surgery, 37 hours. The rescue ICP mean time from injury to surgery, 56 hours. Crossover from stage three, as I said, uh, from medical treatment to DC was 37% uh, of the randomized patients. So with this problem in mind, not having many people is difficult for us. The patient arrives in the, uh, or in the emergency room. We put them uh, in, on the drive room. And in these conditions, we don't have many, in this situation, don't have many conditions to do proper monitoring, etc. So we cannot, uh, only if the patient has got an operation, he could be admitted either in the ICU or in the recovery room. So we did this protocol. And I mean now is primary. It's not secondary craniectomy, as we've seen in the, in the DECRA or in the rescue ICP. That was your protocol. Surgical indication is based on two main factors. Glasgow coma scale between 5 and 3 and 13, and radiological signs of intracranial hypertension. Mean line shift, more than uh, 5 millimeters, effacement of the basal systems, due mainly to cerebral edema or, or with, uh, with or without associated hematoma. So we are talking about, about Marshall uh, 4 upwards, Marshall 3, Marshall 4 upwards. So patients who fulfill this criteria are immediately taken to the OR for the compressive craniectomy. In this patient, we do not routinely monitor ICP, not perform clinical treatment of intracranial hypotension pre-op, except for uh, ATLS procedures and osmotic therapy on the way to the OR. What we have? So uh, I am afraid to say that uh, uh, in those years, four years, we had 84% that uh, patients were discarded due to the lack of the uh, in, uh, all necessary information in the in their files. So we analyzed this ongoing uh, study it was going to, to be published very soon. Uh, Anna Cristina is going to publish uh, some of the results. So we had 350 DCs, almost all of them, I would say more than four, nine, five, nine, seven percent for uh, we are talking about primary unilateral craniectomies. So we did divide in two groups according to the time of from admission to surgery. Less than 12 hours, 218 patients. More than 12 hours, 138 patients, mainly due to late referral or late deterioration. So uh, I must uh, tell you that sometimes the patient need to be uh, driven by roads of uh, five, six hours, 600, 700 kilometers to reach our center coming from, from the countryside. So we did compare age, hospital length of stay, ICU length of stay, stay ICU uh, uh, Glasgow Coma Scale uh, score at the admission, Glasgow Coma Score at the hospital discharge, rate of in infection and CSF leak.
So uh, the groups uh, less than 12 hours, more than 12 hours, age, hospital length of stay, ICU length of stay, there was no difference. When you go to the initial Glasgow coma score, so we did compare less than 12 hours to more than 12 hours. We see it, it was, those groups were different. Why they were different? Because we see that we tend to operate on more early patients in the worst shape. So almost 65% of those patients were operated on uh, within the first 12 hours versus 44%. So what it means, it means that uh, more severe TBI, more grave patients, they are operated on early. When you did compare the outcome, so we saw uh, that uh, no, there was no difference at the hospital discharge. We are now to, uh, to, uh, to gauge in the results after six months, after 12 months, after uh, more, than a, more than a year. So the outcome was the same. And the infection rate, some people can say if you operate on patients in a hurry, the infection rate can be uh, higher, but we didn't find it. But what it means that uh, op although the results were the same, we did treat patients more early, uh, patients who are on more uh, severe uh, neurological status. So we went down and uh, we did compare now patients operate on in ultra early, uh, 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 having an ultra early surgery, I mean less than six hours. And again, we massively operated on patients uh, in a very much uh, bad status than, uh, than uh, the others. So 65% of the patients operate on in the first six hours uh, uh, were uh, in coma. Glasgow score eight or less versus 44%. And again, the outcome and the infection rate were the same. So uh, what, what we, we learn uh, from this uh, question? Uh, until we uh, spend too much time insisting on clinical treatment of refractory intracranial hypertension, Decker ICP 37, rescue ICP 56 for an operation to be decided. To what extent this delay on surgical indication might be responsible for the unexpected functional results seen on the Decker study? Unfortunately, at least for me, I was very sorry to say because I was the, uh, the rescue ICP, uh, I was expecting that should be to be the, the Bible for, for, uh, for for the Christians, how to how we understand the Bible for the Christians uh, to be followed. Uh, unfortunately, the rest of SP did not seem to have clarified some very important issues, as one could have expected. So more R uh, C uh, randomized controlled studies uh, sh uh, should be need to be done, and uh, I, I invite you to to try to go on on this pattern. Uh, so doing this, and uh, we go uh, now to the next stage to the residents. What's the best surgical technique for performing DC? In the med medical literature, there are very few well-designed studies focusing on the best surgical technique for the pr procedure. Uh, in most of the studies, they are retrospective and the uh, opinions of the expert. What uh, we did? We did a randomized controlled study comparing two surgical techniques for the compressed craniectomy, what mainly focused on the uh, watertight duraplasty and without watertight duraplasty. So our results, uh, that without duraplasty is a safe procedure. And in our group, uh, so it was a small group of about 60 patients. Uh, it, was not, it was not associated with the incidence of surgical complications. I mean, CSF leak, wound infection, brain abscess, subgaleal uh, fluid collections. We did decrease the surgical time by 35 minutes, which is very important for very, uh, very ill patients. And it was also 
uh, hospital cost reduction, which for us is very, very important in our NHS, of about 400 US dollars, uh, for, because the, uh, the artificial dura is very expensive here in Brazil. From then now, I said, well, uh, only women are allowed to have artificial dura because I don't have to, to put a scar uh, uh, on the thigh of a, of a woman. So only uh, a woman, uh, a woman, only the women they have. So uh, the the men they come out with a, a, a scar uh, in the on the thigh because we take fascia lata. So the mean surgical time was uh, decreased uh, without dural closure, and uh, we had also the decrease of the hospital cost for each patient. When we go to, go to a, a, a larger group, we, we saw that uh, it's very interesting that the patient that we operate on uh, uh, within the first six hours, uh, we had 53% in whom we did not uh, close the dura versus 4% of the patient who had. So because patients had, were very ill, we want to speed up the operation and it was statistically significant. But uh, that's very important. So uh, in this bigger group, this, this did not lead to a bigger rate of the CSF leak or a bigger rate of uh, CNS infection. So uh, the literature also uh, uh, supports uh, our policy. We see this paper uh, from, from the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, only CSF leak of 0.4%. Uh, so also uh, this pa paper, uh, uh, Peter Shimidek, uh, a very important uh, neurosurgeon in, in professor in Heidelberg. So uh, in this group, a watertight urocloche, is it necessary? A prospective randomized trial in patients with supratentorial craniectomy, no difference in, concerning CSF leak, subgalial collection and infection. So, and also my good friend Volker Seifert from Frankfurt, also rapid closure technique in the compressive craniectomy, 10 years, uh, 341 procedure, no increased the complication compared to historical cohorts. So again, people uh, could ask, uh, well, if you don't do duraplast, when I'm gonna do, do perform a cranioplast, uh, from the technical point of view, it's more difficult. We would, we would say no. Uh, we had a dedicated plastic surgeon who is a member of my department, who is a member. His only duty is to perform the cranioplasties. And we have been uh, 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 studying these patients when we do cranioplasty without, with or without uh, duraplasty. And so we did, uh, we did publish our first experience in surgical neurology. Uh, and uh, what we... Uh, we saw is a very cheap. We had a, a there is a a, 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 a program with a, a T, T 3D printer is very cheap. So compared to the uh, to the big uh, 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 companies that sell those uh, those implants to us, so uh, we have we received the model. We modulate it. Uh, is like that and uh, so we when we do that's for you young guys if you decide to do uh, a, a, decomp a unilateral decomp and a bilateral of course a unilateral dc first of all it needs to be bigger at least more than 145 square centimeters it means a 13 versus 15 but the most important point the most important point we have to is to drill off the pterium, to go flush in the temporal fossa, and to 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 to, to maintain, to keep it, to transform it very very flat. Because here is also where the 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 the, the problem starts. Because here where you have ankle herniation, you have to provide more space. So we need to go flush uh, the temporal. Uh, the temporal uh, uh, fossa needs to be flat, and you need to drill off the pterium as we do for a pterium no craniectomy.
How about our results about the granuloblast? So you, you see that uh, most of the, of the symptoms, when we analyze 55 patients, we analyze a lot of, uh, of signals, signs and, and, and symptoms. So a lot of things got better after craniopathy. It's not only from the, the, the impression of the, uh, of the, the, of the, cos the impression that the cosmetic, cosmetic rehabilitation provides to the patient. It's not a, a, also because we, with the craniopathy, I, I, I usually say that Mother Nature did not do the brain to be under the positive atmospheric positive pressure. So we did restore the, the, uh, the, the cerebrovascular uh, regulation. We, do, uh, we did restore uh, the, the cerebral blood functions. We did restore the cerebral metabolism, mainly, even in the other uh, hemisphere. Uh, which has not been touched. So uh, cranioplast provides not only cosmetic improvement, but also neurologic improvement. So, but we have to be very careful that uh, uh, the, although as a simple operation, we have some problems, we did need to reoperate on 17% of our patients. And there are, uh, 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 there are one thing that I would like to, to remind you be very careful because it was first described by, by our, uh, uh, our friends in Israel. So it's a, a massive malignant brain swelling after the, uh, we do the, the craniopathy. There is, uh, for me, uh, uh, I never found a, 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 a scientific explanation which could, uh, uh, I, I could accept it. Uh, because the patient developed this massive uh, cerebral swelling. So uh, the, the patient, the relatives, uh, don't expect this very bad result. So we have around 30 and 40 patients described in literature today. So you need to be aware of this complication. And one tip that we will give, and most of them, would, you'll never put your sub, you'll never put a negative pressure. You never put aspiration on your subgaleal drain. You leave just the fluid to drain by gravity. Never put in pressure. It seems that perhaps uh, due to a lot of mechanisms, very difficult to understand, according to literature, if you put negative aspiration, uh, 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 suction in your subgaleal drain, you might, uh, this can be one of the things uh, which could facilitate the appearance of this very, very uh, uh, complication because most of the patients have died. So my final remarks, uh, I think that I'm inside my time. Uh, I'd like to say that although patients operated on, on the first 12 hours after the mission, presented with worse score on, Gla on Glasgow uh, scale, after 12 hours, when you, uh, you see, we did operate on patients again on the worst shape uh, mob early. The functional results are the same. <coughs> so, uh, but I, uh, I say that with policy, because of our difficulties, uh, doing this primary DC, I think we could save a lot of lives uh, or which could not be saved if the patients were left in the emergency room or perhaps even the ICU with raising the cranial pressure. And of course, uh, when you, we've, uh, we have the opportunity to study and to follow those patients after many months after surgery, and many months of, or even years after surgery, I think that we have, we, I'm going to have a very, we're going to have a very nice surprise about how good results could, could be. And if you go to the literature, and the, when you ask the, the patient, when you ask the, the relatives whether or not they are satisfied with the decision to have, they took for uh, allowing us to, to do the operation, most of the answer that we have 
and there are papers in the, in the literature uh, broaching this issue, is most of the, uh, 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 those questions are answered on a positive way. Uh, again, uh, we have also the same results when you do ultra early operation. I mean, during the first six hours after admission. But again, even, the, uh, even more, we operate on patient when the uh, worst shape uh, uh, more early. So doing this policy, uh, again, my feeling is that uh, accor according to our, uh, 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 our situation, according to our uh, setup, uh, many lives have been saved. So again, I think that DC has a relative uh, benefit. Uh, and again, I emphasize that these results are very early result, results. And uh, when you could start them later on, so perhaps we could uh, find, uh, as I said, a very nice surprise. Is a uh, is ongoing study that uh, we plan to, to publish uh, very soon. And uh, again, as a point that is, uh, and, uh, I, I need to, for the first time, perhaps to, uh, in this, this situation, to disagree one of the icons of, uh, uh, of my, one of the giant, I say, uh, of my, my life, my neurosurgical life, it was uh, Dr. Harvey Cushing. I tell to my residents, uh, we need to, uh, I tell you young lads, that we need to know uh, the lives of the giants who, starts, uh, who started our specialty and uh, in, in whose shoulders we very humbly we stand because as Professor William Osler, although I, I do consider him one of the best doctors in the 20th century, we imagine that he was a professor of medicine at the McGill, professor of medicine at the Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia, uh, one of the founders of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And he came, he was asked by the King of uh, England or, or Queen Victoria to come to Oxford to be religious professor of medicine. And he was the, the scientific father of the Dr. Harvey Cushing. And he was the, uh, the man who, uh, uh, Changed the, the medical teaching, saying that uh, uh, the students and the trainees should be go to the ward, should touch the patient. But he he also said, uh, uh, amongst many many uh, metaphors, he said, if you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going to. So I would persuade you to go and to uh, to study a bit the life of those giants uh, on those on the, uh, on. on uh, whose shoulders we very humbly uh, stern. So again, uh, we did gain with the, with the time, we did gain with the reduction cost, we did gain, uh, uh, we, we did knowing that uh, uh, without uh, closing the dura in, the, in our patients, we did, did not have uh, increased complication and I, I would remind CSF leak and infection. So it is our team, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry if I did extend my, and uh, I, I keep saying that uh, nothing, nothing can uh, uh, drop down the, uh, the tremendous work. So keep studying, keep working, keep learning, keep uh, listening to the, your patient, touching your patient. My, my, my good mentor, uh, Chris Adams in Oxford would say, uh, we never operate on a CT and an MRI. Uh, be always skeptical about the data that you see in the literature. Go study, go learning, and always try to do, as he used to say, the KISS technique. What's KISS technique, boss? Is keep it simple and safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ildo. We would like to open to questions and commentaries. So far, we have um, congratulations from uh, Dr. 
Tango from South Africa, Pablo Villanueva, Andres Kubilam, uh, Dr. Tsagaib from Ethiopia, and asking for the contact that we already provide. So if you have any comments or any question, feel, please feel free to type it. Or ask. We would like to uh, congratulate and thank Dr. Wildu for his time and for the brilliant presentation. We know that um, uh, Hospital of Dr. Tarasso has a huge experience in neurotrauma and in the compressive craniectomies, something that we, 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 are, um, we are trying to uh, expertise. And we would like to share uh, one last uh, questionnaire about the, um, the presentation. So if you can answer, please. We have now 32 participants. If you can answer, would you do primary decompressive uh, uh, Anna, I'm sorry, there was a question about if I, I had experience with cisternotomy. Uh, I, uh, I know this work from my, yes. uh, a young, at the time I was a young neurosurgeon from Nepal. And uh, I tried to do three or four times this surgery. For me, it was very difficult. It did not have uh, help and I had to turn out and do a, a, a big DC. Thank you. Yes, the question now from Dr. Pablo Villanova. No. Uh, in fact, there is very little experience uh, in sternotomy here in Brazil. Some students went from Sao Paulo, went with Dr. Um, from Nepal just to, to, to try and see how this. Sorry? Ipe, Ipe Sharian. Yes, Ipe Sharian. Thank you, Ignatius. Went with him for uh, an, an stadium, but here in Brazil, there's very little experience with that. Okay, we have seven votes of 30. If someone else could answer the questionnaire. Okay, then now. Can I just say, um, please? Uh, thanks, many thanks to Professor um, Hildo for a very nice talk. I really, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm a big fan of the randomized trial that you published from your department. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I have said that we do the same. So we don't do a sutured duroplasty uh, in, in Cambridge. Uh, so all our craniectomies are um, like this. Um, if I may just make a comment, so in terms of the primary craniectomy, I, I fully agree with what you said, uh, as long as the indication is right. So, you know, Rescue SP and DECRA, as you know, they were, and as you said, they were conducted in high income settings. Um, so the protocol design was that those patients would go in the ICU first for ICP monitoring and medical management of their ICP. Uh, so primary craniectomy was not really an option. So I think, you know, we cannot compare um, apples with oranges, if you know what I mean. It was a different indication. It was a different study design. Uh, on the other hand, the rest of the subdural is closely, perhaps is closer to a primary craniectomy because these are patients with an acute subdural who need to have evacuation of the subdural, uh, which obviously happens uh, quicker, uh, so very close to the time of the injury. So that is that, that is going to be the, the trial that will probably answer the primary craniectomy issue. But Thank rescue ICP and, and DECRA were not primary craniectomy studies. It was, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. there were trials looking at secondary craniectomy. But it's the only study that I can, uh, I can, uh, Refer uh, to try to, to analyze and to you know, no, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's the only Bible that we have. <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a Bible, I'm afraid. It's not a Bible, yeah. but anyhow, congratulations for your work. And uh, um, we are very here. Uh, I understand that Andres Fluviano is also uh, present to this room, and so we are. Uh, here and uh, very happy to join any study that we could uh, go deeper further on. Oh, excellent! Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, we, uh, yeah, definitely. Because um, uh, Wellington Paiva from uh, Sao Paulo yeah, uh, and, and Andres, they're both interested in, uh, in a trial of uh, hinge float, so decompressive craniotomy. So, you know, a hinge floating craniotomy versus craniectomy. So yeah, we will uh, we will we'll keep in touch definitely. But uh, as I said, uh, Professor Gole, you call it. Uh, my, I what I, I do prefer to live in the trainees, uh, in the brain of the trainees, more doubts than answers, because this will force them to go to study, to do research, and try yeah. to to uh, to find the answer by themselves. Yeah, with, hard, with not, very hard work, with very hard work. Very hard. Yeah, and there are not many things. There are not many things in medicine which are black and white, as we yeah. all know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. You are a bit Thank skeptical. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> I very much enjoyed your um, talk, uh, yeah. Christiana. Thank you very much for organizing this. Are there any other questions? No, no questions at all. So I would like to thank everyone who participated to thank the, the WFNS Young Neurosurgeon Forum for the opportunity and to thank Dr. Rildo for the brilliant presentation. So we like to invite you, all of you one more, once more to follow us on social media, on the, uh, uh, Young Neurosurge, on Insta Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, and on our own uh, website, just to keep in touch and to see our work and progress to it all. Thank you very thank you. much all for your participation. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Collins. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. So let's keep yes. working for the WFNS. Uh, together, we go further. Yes, indeed. Thank indeed. you very indeed. much. Thanks Thank ever so much. Uh, well, a very, uh, very beautiful holiday season for all of you. And uh, that new year brings less coronavirus to all of us. Okay. Indeed, likewise. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much, Christiana. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.